On Saturday the 11th of May 1889, cotton merchant James Maybrick died after a short illness at his home, Battlecrease House in the Grassendale suburb of Liverpool. Following his death, on account of two doctors becoming suspicious about its manner, a police investigation was launched. From the outset, the investigating officers were convinced that James Maybrick had been murdered by his American wife, Florence Elizabeth Maybrick. On the evening of Saturday the 18th of May, she was arrested as she lay ill in bed at Battlecrease House and was charged with her husband's murder. At her trial, which began on July the 31st and which was presided over by Mr Justice Stephen, Florence was found guilty of murder and was sentenced to death. However, on the 22nd of August, the Home Secretary, Henry Matthews, issued a reprieve and her sentence was commuted to one of penal servitude for life. Having served 15 years, she was released from prison in February 1904, after which she returned to America, where she died in 1941. In 1992, a journal came to light, which, although the author didn't give his name, was obviously supposed to have been written by James Maybrick. In the journal, which has since been heavily promoted as a diary, the writer makes the claim that he was Jack the Ripper. Since the journal was the first time that the name of James Maybrick was linked in any way to the Whitechapel murders, the strength of the case for Maybrick having been history's most infamous serial killer rests solely on whether or not the so-called diary was in fact written by him. Curious to know more about the supposed Ripper diary, I approached Chris Jones, co-author of the book The Maybrick Murder and the Diary of Jack the Ripper, The Endgame. I'll put a link to the book in the description down below should you wish to acquire a copy. If anyone can explain the chequered history of what, since its discovery in 1992, has, to say the least, proved to be a highly controversial document, Chris is the man to do it. He graciously accepted my request for an interview, and I began by asking him, who exactly was James Maybrick? James Maybrick was a, a Liverpool cotton merchant who was born in 1838. His family were, I suppose you'd call them lower middle class. His father was uh, the, the parish clerk for Liverpool's preeminent church at that time. Since then, it's been knocked down and replaced by the Anglican Cathedral. So they were, a, you know, they were an important family, quite a respectable family. Uh, and James seems to have had a pretty normal, happy childhood, although some of the evidence for that is, isn't as great as we would, we would like. Um, he went down to London in the 18, eight, around about 1858. Uh, he got working for a guy called Gustav Witt, and he learnt about trading. He made some trips to America, and in 1874, he was confident enough to set up his own cotton merchant company with his younger brother, Edwin, and he went across to, uh, from about, but he, from the, the earliest record we have is from about 1869, but from 1874 onwards, he spent about six months every year in America, primarily in Norfolk, Virginia, but in some of the other seaside ports linked with cotton. Uh, and he developed, at that time, rather a successful cotton merchant business. Am I correct in saying, of all the Jack the Ripper suspects, he's the only suspect that was actually murdered, or I'll, I'll rephrase that, was supposedly or allegedly murdered himself? Well, it, I'm sure you're going to ask about that later on. There's a big question about whether he was actually murdered by his wife, but you are quite right that in uh, 1889, in the Liverpool Assizes, his wife Florence was convicted of his murder, uh, although in many people's eyes, and particularly in my eyes, it was a rather suspect conviction. Um, she was never pardoned. She spent 15 years in jail. But if there was a court of appeal, I think she would have been released almost instantaneously because it was a very, very uh, suspect verdict. And, and that's uh, the interesting thing about that, because uh, her, her being uh, imprisoned and then released after 15 years... Am I also correct to think that, that was part of the establishment or it was one of the cases that led to the establishment of a court of appeal? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it, it was um, in very simple terms. She was supposed to have murdered James by administering arsenic to him. 
But what made it such a, a weak case was that he habitually used arsenic. It started it in the 1870s as a cure for uh, malaria, and he kept taking it because he, it was seen as a pick-me-up uh, to try and improve his strength and uh, as an aphrodisiac. He also took other dangerous chemicals, drugs, such as strychnine. So the fact that he had some arsenic in his body, and it was only a very, very small amount, by the way, insufficient to kill him, but the fact that he had arsenic in his body uh, suggested or gave the prosecution the opportunity to suggest that he'd been murdered. But as, as he was a habitual user of the drug, it's no great surprise that he actually had some of the drug in his body. And would I be correct in, in, in saying or assuming that mo most of Florence's conviction or uh, the fact she was found guilty was, ba was judgmental on her moral state as opposed to the physical evidence? In other words, the fact she'd had an affair uh, was do you think that influenced the jury more than the actual physical evidence that he'd been poisoned? Uh, there's no doubt about it. That was a major factor. I, I, I wouldn't. It's difficult for us to judge in the jury's mind, but it was certainly in the judge's mind. The judge, because Florence had had a very brief affair. She stayed two nights in a hotel in London with a man called Alfred Brealey. And there's no doubt in the, in the mind of the judge, Judge Stephen, that anybody who would be break the law, not break the law, but would be morally um, deviant, could be criminally deviant. Um, but I think there was more to the case than just that. Um, there, was, there was some circumstantial evidence, and there was one key, when the jury were asked afterwards why they found her guilty, they, they focused on one key incident in which she did add some mysterious powder to, um, to, a, to a meat juice, which which he never actually took. So you're right in the sense that it was an important factor, but it certainly wasn't the only factor. And didn't one of the servants say that the, um, the, the, the food tasted different? Uh, because obviously <laughs> arsenic has quite a strong taste and it had to be disguised. And didn't <laughs> one of the servants make the comment, the food tasted different? Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. The, 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 the nanny, uh, uh, Nurse Yap, she wasn't a nurse, she was a nanny, but she... When two of James's friends arrived at the house, Mrs. Briggs and Mrs. Hughes, she famously said, uh, the mistress is poisoning the master. Um, now, that possibly was relating to, you're right, the, the, um, the food, which was supposedly taste, tasting a little bit different to how it should taste. But also there was an incident the night before, or two nights before, when a, the, the, the local chemist refused to make up a uh, prescription which had been sent for for James, but that was a complete mix-up. Uh, it was that they didn't make it up simply because it hadn't been signed by the doctor. But it, it was a time of rumour and idle gossip, and Florence was very much the victim of all this idle speculation. And uh, and of course, the other thing you, you mentioned arsenic being the uh, uh, effectively the weapon of choice. Uh, and of course, the thing about arsenic was it turned up in so many things anyway in the Victorian period. It was in foods. It was added, added to all sorts of things. It was in toys. It was in wallpaper. It was everywhere, wasn't it? You're absolutely right. And that is one of the reasons why they changed the law to try and uh, just make sure that you couldn't put it into a substance without somebody knowing. As you said before, it was given a, a bitter taste. That's why they tried to disguise the taste by adding it to something strong like brandy. Uh, or a strong taste in food. The key ingredient, as far as, oh, sorry, the, the key uh, thing in which arsenic was found, as far as the trial is concerned, was fly papers. Uh, fly papers were used to kill flies. Now, what made it such a, a, an important element in the trial was that in 1884, two women in Liverpool had been convicted for murder. Uh, they tried to kill three people so that they could uh, gain insurance money and they killed um, the three people by using arsenic extracted from fly papers. So when Florence bought fly papers, which she did to make a, a mild cosmetic solution, it, it set off all sorts of alarm bells. And it was, it was part of this circumstantial evidence which came like a tsunami and swept her away. Uh, and, and it opened the gate to all these gossips and speculation about her behaviour.
just very quickly mentioning the judge in question, jo Justice Stevens. He, of course, was the father, wasn't he, of J.K. Stephen, who's he also was, a yes. Jack the Ripper suspect. <laughs> he was, yeah. Uh, he was a very distinguished judge for most of his career. But when he, when he looked at Florence's trial, sorry, when he was the judge at Florence's trial and he presided over it, he was at the very end of his career and he'd suffered ill health. And there is evidence to suggest that that impacted on the way he conducted the trial. He got quite a few quite important dates mixed up and he made some quite serious errors. For example, uh, Jay, one, of, one of the important witnesses for the defence said that he heard James um, say, blurt out, I've taken poisonous chemicals or poisonous substances. But the judge put, fixed that saying a completely an earlier point in time. And that was quite fundamental because if James had taken this substance when the judge heard it, then that would explain why he had arsenic in his body. Um, so the, the judge was a distinguished man, but he was past his sell by date, shall we say. And when Florence tried, but they couldn't appeal the decision as such because there was no court of appeal. But when they tried to rescind the guilty verdict, it was one of the focus of their campaign was the way that the, the judge conducted the trial. And he did, didn't he, shortly afterwards, didn't he go into an asylum as well? Yeah, a few years later, yeah. He, 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 it didn't, it's, some people tell you it happened immediately after. That's not the case. But it, yes, within a very short period, he did, yes. He and he, 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 even himself, in some of his reminiscence, always said that it was one, one of the verdicts that he, it bothered him right up until the very end. Right, sir. And so, so we have James Maybrick then, so cotton merchant, Liverpool. Did he spend time in London? Did he spend a lot of time in London? Well, he, he certainly spent time in London. Um, as I say, the, the evidence suggests round about 1858, he went down to London and he worked off. He worked for a man called Gustav Witt, whose offices were in Fen Court off Fenchurch Street. Now, Fenchurch Street, I'm sure many of your listeners will know, is very close to Mitre Square, um, where Catherine Eddowes was was was. was killed or certainly a body was found um he he worked in london now it's, it's difficult to give an exact date but certainly for most of the 1860s he was there but by 1871 he was back in liverpool because he's in the census there he then lived either in liverpool or america for six months a year nevertheless he did continue from time to time to come down to london partly on business uh, because obviously a cotton merchant has got to know what's going on um, in a business sense because the price of cotton fluctuates very quickly. So you've got to be, uh, you have to have your ear to the ground. But also because he had friends and relatives in London. Uh, one of his brothers, Michael Mayrick, who was a famous uh, singer and composer, lived in London. And we know uh, in June 1888, he was also in London because he was visiting Gustav Witt, his old friend and business uh, partner. Um, he was also a man who was great, in, great into horse racing, so he would have come down uh, to London on other occasions. So he was no stranger to London, uh, even in, when he lived in Liverpool. And in London, therefore, did he spend time in Whitechapel? Yes. Okay. He, he spent time near Whitechapel, should we say. As you, as you know, Finch, we, there's, there, there, there is a, a reference to James, uh, James Maybrick, of Lime Street. Now, there's a very famous Lime Street in Liverpool, connected with the railway station, but there's, there's also a Lime Street or Fenchurch Street in London, uh, which, I, which is where I believe he lived for a while. Uh, and that's not too far away from the Whitechapel area. Uh, and there's no, I, I think it's, it, it probably is the case that he had some familiarity with the area, yes. Because yeah. because uh, Lime uh, Fen Court and Lime Street are both it's where the Lloyd Lloyd's Insurance Building is. Absolutely. And yeah. within three minutes you're in Mitre Square. Yes. And then within a minute after that you cross the boundary and you're on Whitechapel High Street and, yes. and then Commercial Street. You're at the epicenter. So Absolutely, it's yeah. a very close indeed. So that brings me down to another point then, because we've talked about him being poisoned by Florence. We've talked about her trial of her being found guilty, sent to prison, well sentenced to death to begin with. And Absolutely. then having been sentenced to death, it was commuted by the Home Secretary, Henry Matthews, at the time. Uh, and then she serves 15 years in prison. But the one thing I'm not hearing in 
any of this is that he was Jack the Ripper. <laughs> well, as I'm sure you well know, that doesn't come out until uh, 1992. Uh, nobody at the time, absolutely nobody, any friend, any relative, any enemy, any police officer, anybody connected with law and order, had him in any way, shape or form down to be uh, Jack the Ripper or indeed to be a criminal of any sort. And then, so 1992 comes along and what puts him into the frame, so to speak, is the discovery of a diary. And the diary purportedly was written by him in which he talks about the Jack the Ripper murders as, as the perpetrator of the crimes. So could you tell us how the diary was discovered? Oh, how it was discovered is, 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 a, uh, is a different question to how it came to light. So if I deal with that bit first. Indeed. Um, uh, a retired scrap merchant named Michael Barrett claimed that the, the, it's not, I'm going to call, we keep calling it a diary, it's really a journal, a uh, confessional document, because there's only one date in it. But just for, for the ease of this programme, I'll, I'll call it a diary. Um, Mike Barrett claimed that it was given to him by one of his drinking buddies in a, they used to drink in a pub in Curtail called The Saddle, um, who gave it to him and said, do something with it. He took it home, uh, looked at it, and suddenly saw at the very end of, of this short document, um, it was signed Jack the Ripper, yours truly Jack the Ripper, and dated the 3rd of May, 1888, 1889, sorry, uh, which was the week before James Maybrick died. So um, about a month later, he rang um, London, he rang Dory Montgomery, uh, who, was, uh, who was worked for a, um, a publishing agency there, and said he had the diary of Jack the Ripper. At the time, he called himself Williams, not Barrett, probably because he, real, he wasn't quite sure of the situation because if, if it was a forgery, whether he was involved in that or not, or even, even, if, even if he wasn't involved, he must have looked at the document and thought it was a bit suspect. So he's probably testing the water before he fully committed. So he gave a false name. And then a month or so later, he took it to London and it was inspected by Dorian Montgomery and the, the writer Shirley Harrison. And they came to believe in its authenticity uh, and went to work on it and published the book, as you know. And that, so, and with this diary, oh, he, um, he, he talks about the murders uh, and uh, 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 he, uh, or says that he, he committed the murders. Is there anything in what he says uh, in that diary or in that document? Is there anything he says that is not in the public domain that would be unique knowledge of the crimes? Relating to the to the actual murders, the, to, just murders themselves. No, to the actual murders. Side. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely nothing at all, zero. Um, if we if, if we call it a journal for a second, uh, and he, he talks about two separate things. He talks about the uh, his family life, uh, and he talks about the murders. Um, in his family life. His motive for committing the murders is that his wife is having an affair. He's extremely angry um, and he goes down to London and kills the prostitutes of London. It's a very, very weak narrative, very, very weak motive. Um, James Maybrick was a man who was prone to anger. Um, and if he'd have found out that his wife was having an affair, the first people who would have, uh, and the only people who would have felt his anger would have been his wife and her lover, uh, Brealey. He wouldn't have gone down to London. That wasn't his style. You know, in, in the 1870s, he spent a lot of time with prostitutes. There's no evidence that he had a dislike of them. Um, so that, that doesn't, doesn't fit in. As far as the murders are concerned, he says that he committed seven. Two in Manchester and the five canical uh, victims. Uh, he only mentions a, one of them by name, but fr from the other details he provides, you can tell who they are. Um, just to give you an example of how weak a document it is, he talks about these two murders in Manchester, but he gives no details. It doesn't tell you when, he doesn't tell you exactly where, he doesn't tell you why, he doesn't tell you how, he doesn't tell you anything. Why does he do that? Well, I would argue because he's, he doesn't want to be caught out. So he's providing the most sketchy of details. So no research, no matter how brilliant 
they were, could ever track down those two murders. As far as the other murders are concerned, he's equally brief about them. For example, the first murder in London is the poly, well, is assumed to be anyway, the Polly Nichols murder. He covers that in three sentences, four lines. Now, this is a pivotal event. This is his first major killing in London. For people who are serial killers, this would have been a huge event, a traumatic event, a major event. They would have gone to town about it. They would have wrote a lot about it. They would have provided details. They would have provided the emotions and the feelings. They would have told you things which weren't in the public domain. None of that happens. Three simple sentences, all the information of which are easily extracted from books available about the cases. And the same is replicated about the other murders. Um, for some of them, he says a little bit more detail, but nothing new at all. And he does manage to managed include to... several uh, <laughs> fallacies about the murders that have, cro- cro- uh, that have crept into Ripper law since. Uh, for example, doesn't he include about Mary Kelly's body parts being spread yeah, he, and hung he, around the room? Yeah, he does. You're absolutely right. He 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 put he, he makes some statements uh, in relation to as we as you know the the, the Ripper did savagely brutalise the poor woman and took out many of her organs, but in the diary, um, the diarist who I don't think is James Maybrick, but either way, we call him the diarist for the moment, uh, makes errors about where these various parts were found. Um, Some people will say, Shirley Harrison says, um, that, oh, he's bound to have made mistakes because, you know, he was in a frenzy. Well, she's inconsistent about that because on other occasions, she she says he has a remarkable memory when he deals with the, the murder of Catherine Eddowes because he talks about the, you know, the various possessions that were found uh, which, which you can remember in micro detail, but that's so. Some people who were pro diary, change, they're not very consistent in their views. On the one hand, the diarist has got this brilliant memory. On the other hand, he can't remember everything. It, it, it changes to suit the circumstances. So, so the whole claim then that he was Jack the Ripper <clears throat> is purely and simply it has to be on the authenticity of the diary. That that's Absolutely. that's all there is about his guilt. There's no physical evidence from the scenes of the crimes. Yep. There's no eyewitnesses who might have seen him with the victims. It's the authenticity of the diary that tells uh, that we've got to use to judge whether James Maybrick was Jack the Ripper or not. Absolutely. Just sticking with the eyewitnesses for one second, of course, um, I, 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 I looked at the whether James was Jack the Ripper under 10 different headings because I wanted to take a holistic view. Uh, the, diary, the diary is obviously absolutely right, is the cru- crucial key element within it. Um, But obviously there were eyewitnesses and I use the Philip Sugden um, book where he identifies six people who who we think anyway had a reasonable view of the killer. Um, Philip Sugden says from that you can deduce that the man would have been in his 20s or his 30s. James was in his was almost 50. Um, So from the eyewitness evidence that we have, which is, you know, not perfect, obviously, um, because he was never caught, but from the eyewitness evidence that we have got, James didn't in the slightest resemble um, Jack the Ripper, the descriptions that we have. But in the main, you're absolutely right. Um, It all rests on the diary. There are some other possible exceptions you can bring in. The diarist, for instance, implies very much that he wrote the Dear Boss letter. He says in one, one section, I will send a central another one, which implies he wrote that letter. It also, he also implies, because he took a kidney, that he, you can argue he's suggesting that he wrote the, the from hell letter. So we can use the diary in the, as our main point uh, of judging whether James makes a credible candidate. But there are other things that we can look at, such as um, some of the statements he makes in the diary, whether he, he, he wrote any of the letters and whether he matches eyewitness descriptions. And of course, one other thing that we can look at is whether he, in any way, shape or form, matches a profile of a serial killer, a pathological killer. Um, So I do use the diary because that's the number one important piece, but it isn't the only piece of evidence. And do we know if he was in what you, you said he spent time in America Time in, time in Liverpool, came to London. Every, 
Do we know if he was was in Whitechapel or in London even at the time of the murders? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, there's, there's, there's no evidence to suggest that. As I say, they, 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 it's called a diary, but there's only one date in the diary. I think that's what I, I, some people will call, tell you that the diary is a crude forgery. It's, it's lots of things, but it isn't crude. It's very, very clever, I think. You know, why would you only put one date in it? Uh, because he, the person who wrote it was concerned that at a later point in time, somebody might find an alibi for James. Um, in relation to the, the, the actual, the, the five canical uh, killings, so far, nobody has managed to come up with an alibi which fixes James in Liverpool at the time of, of the, the murders. But on the other hand, nobody's actually pinpointed him of being in London at the time of the killings. So, so and you, you say one date. What, what was the one date? All right, then. The, the, the very, very final section of the diary, the very last bit, as I say, it, it, it signs yours truly, Jack the Ripper, and gives the date the 3rd of May. Now, the 3rd of May date is quite significant uh, because on the 3rd of May, it's the last day that James goes into his office. Um, he, he, he was feeling very ill in the morning, um, but he, he, the doctor gives him permission to go to, well, says he can go to his office if he wants to. Goes to his office, he spends a couple of hours there. He then goes for a Turkish bath, but he comes home and he's exceedingly weak. He's not very well at all. So much so that he's vomiting, he's being sick, and he goes to bed. He's complaining that his limbs are, are, are operating properly, which is, by the way, a classic symptom of strychnine poisoning, um, uh, because that affects your muscle, muscle movement. So he's lying in bed. He's not very well. People are constantly popping in and out of the room. Um, in the evening, he's so bad that a doctor has to come out again. So we're asked to believe that this man who was in this terrible state of health suddenly finishes off that document on that day and signs it. It's, it's, it's just not really a, a, a credible viewpoint. Uh, the date is also significant because some people suggest that having completed his final piece of writing in the diary, he's then got to hide it somewhere. Uh, now, James lived in a house called Battle Creek in Riversdale Road in, in Liverpool. And it's, it's a wonderful house. You can go there today. I was there, I was there myself on Sunday. Um, he had on the ground floor an office. And it was an office which he kept locked. Only he had the key. Not e even his wife was allowed in there. The servants could go in, um, but only when he was around, because he wouldn't let them go in on, the, on his own. Um, if he was going to hide something like a, his confessional document, that's the place he would have stored it. But some people suggest what he did, despite this physical state of ill health that he was in, he finished off the diary, wrote all these tremendous thoughts, and then somehow managed to lift thick wooden boards, floorboards, uh, fitted with brass nails, which would have broken, and then placed the diary underneath the floorboards. Uh, which is where, where it was hidden for the next... Oh, oh, sorry, and fixed the floorboards back again with new brass nails, which would have taken a lot of hammering, made an awful lot of noise. Um, and then supposedly under this hypothesis, that's where the diary was for the next 100 years till it was found by some electricians. The, the whole story is incredibly weak from beginning to end. It just doesn't hold together. So, so it, the, the electricians found it when they were renovating or...? Well, no, that's, no, that's one viewpoint. Uh, the people who believe in the diary, one of the problems with the diary is, well, there's lots of problems with the diary, but one of the major problems with the diary is it's, it's total lack of provenance. Um, Barrett says it was given to him by a guy called Tony Devereux, but Tony Devereux was already dead. So nobody could ever uh, check that story. So in a sense... The provenance stops in 1992. So the people who believe that the diary might be genuine had to look around elsewhere. One of the things that they came up with was that the diary must have been hidden somewhere. And since James didn't leave the house from the 3rd of May to his death on the 11th of May, 1889, it means that if he was going to hide it, the only place he could have hidden it would have been in his own house. Um, 
Now, what gives this story a little bit of legs is that quite a lot of electrical work was take, has taken place over the, year, over the years in, in the house. The current owner, Paul Dodd, um, has, has had, did have electricians coming in. And on one day, the 9th of March, there were some electricians working on the first floor where, the James, where James's and Florence's bedroom was. Um, at the end, on the end of the day on the 9th of March, Michael Barrett rings London and says, I got the diary of Jack the Ripper. So this hypothesis suggests that the electricians in the morning pick up the floorboards, find the diary. One of the electricians who, who lived quite close to Barrett sells it to him in a pub. He then rings London. Uh, so that, 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 that has given some legs because of that coincidence of the date, the 9th of March, 1992. However, once, as I said before, there are all sorts of flaws with this problem. Um, first of all, you know, you've got this, this man, James Maybrick, who was, who was ill, writing his diary, picking up floorboards, hiding it, putting the floorboards all back so it was never discovered. That, that doesn't ring true. No floorboards were actually raised on the 9th of March in James's bedroom. The work involved mainly going down a hallway and into one corner of the inner dressing room, which was a small room off the bedroom. Now, in that room, floorboards had already previously been lifted. They'd been lifted in 1946 by Paul Dodd's father, Sam, Samuel Dodd. Uh, they'd be actually did before that. They'd actually been lifted in the 1920s when the house was converted from electricity uh, from gas into electricity. They were lifted in 1946 by Samuel Dodd, and they were lifted again in 1977 uh, by Paul Dodd himself when he did some electrical work in the house. So wherever the, the diary was or wasn't, it was not under the floorboards. <laughs> and th this is the 9th of March, 1992. It's correct, yeah, not, yeah, the, yeah. yeah the day, yeah. So when, when it's found. So um, of course, the other thing about uh, diary, the diary's provenance is, has it been subjected to scientific examination to sort of authenticate <laughs> Is the ink of the right age? Is the paper of the right age? Has anything like that been done on it? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's been a, there's been a lot of tests. Um, let's just deal with the paper first of all. Um, it, it's pretty clear that the the document itself is a Victorian document. It, it, it's it's an old scrapbook or photograph album. Um, the first forty odd pages have been ripped out. Then there's writing on sixteen pages, and then there's some pages blank at the end. Now, although it's a Victorian document, it's not a diary, it's a scrapbook. And such scrapbooks are very easy to obtain. I've actually got two myself, um, which I bought. Uh, Robert Smith, the guy who owns the diary now, he's also got one, I think from like 1871. So and yourself or any of your listeners could go along to most large antique sellers and buy a scrapbook. Now, that's a little bit telling for itself because um, you can't buy a diary, but you can buy a scrapbook. Now, James was a very, very neat man. He was very concerned about the way he um, looked and the way he acted. Uh, he was always very smartly turned out. The idea that such a man would have written his innermost thoughts in a ripped, um, scruffy old scrapbook is very unlikely. Um, it's also unlikely uh, because from some of the, the markings in it indicates that it was used as a photograph album as well because the, the Victorians are very strong in this, as were the Edwardians. And the imprint suggests that it, it had photographs from the 1930s in it because that was the typical size of photographs from the 1930s. So although the science of the paper suggests it could be, and it probably is Victorian, the rest of the paper elements of the scrapbook just fall to pieces because it's a it's a ripped scrapbook, not a diary. Um, now the ink is more of a, a controversial area, and the ink has been tested in a couple of different ways. One of the ways is on the composition of the ink. Is there anything in the ink, any chemical that you wouldn't have found in Victorian times? Now the evidence on that has been totally contradictory. Um, some people suggest very strongly that they found elements that weren't typical of Victorian ink. Uh, 
other people will tell, no, 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 that's not the case. And one of the problems you have with that is trying to square this circle is simply that in Victorian times, a lot of people made their own inks. Um, so if you've got the, the ambition, the motive, and you wanted to produce a, a, an ink with the chemicals that you would typically find in many Victorian inks, you could go ahead and do it. The most important test, as far as I'm concerned, is what's called solubility. When you put right on a piece of paper, the ink starts to integrate with the paper. The longer uh, it's been on the paper, the more it's integrated. Now, there's been a couple of tests on those. One of these was, was by Dr. Baxendale. He put a solvent on the ink, and when he did, the ink dissolved in, within seconds. And that indicates, in my mind, absolutely clearly that the ink was only put on paper very recently. So the people, the pro and the anti-diary people, picked their own different scientific reports. Um, most of the people, in fact, all the people that I've ever spoken to who believe in the diary never talk about the ink solubility question. And I'm not surprised because it blows them out the water. <laughs> And so, so effectively, we can say that the inks of the era, the papers of the era. So the major question is, when did, when did the two come together? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not saying the ink is of the of the of of the Victorian era. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that there's nothing being found in the ink conclusively that that will show you that it, it that it, it wouldn't. You know, it, it's not contemporaneous with the time. But that doesn't mean to say that a clever forger couldn't have made their own ink um, with compounds that would have been similar to what the compounds that would have been found in Victorian inks. So with, with, May, with it being found or supposedly found in Maybrick's house. Uh, oh, sorry, can I, inter sorry, can I interrupt you for one second there? Yeah. That's only one of the hypotheses, by the way, the, the, the under the floorboards one. There are other uh, stories. What, what, one of the problems with, with the um, the diary's provenance isn't just that it suddenly appears in 1992, but the people who were involved with it have told a multitude of different stories. So Michael Barrett, for instance, has said he was given to him by Tony Devereux. Then he said at one point he forged it. Another time he said he forged it with his wife. Um, his wife came up with a different story. Oh, sorry, his ex-wife. Um, they, they were divorced um, she said that it was given to her, uh, it came from her grandfather, who was a friend of the nurse Yap we mentioned before. Uh, so you gave it to a, to a relative. It came from from via this nurse Yap. And then later on, there's even a suggestion that uh, Anne Graham, who is who is the ex-wife of Michael Barrett, is the the granddaughter of um, the illegitimate child of Florence Maybrick. So there are, there are quite a few hypotheses out there, but not just the under the floorboards one. Uh, and that's another problem for the people who are pro-diary because they all select different stories to suit their particular argument. So for instance, Paul Fellman, for instance, who was very interested in the diary, who believed in the, in, in the authenticity of the diary, he dismissed the under the floorboards hypothesis out of hands. He said the, uh, the electricians were prepared to lie if, if the price was right. Um, he went down very much the route that it came via Anne Graham uh, and she got it because she was the descendant of Florence Maybrick, uh, which is it's the weakest. That's if, if the under the floorboards hypothesis is weak, this is even weaker again. Um, but that's the trouble, you know, the, the, the provenance is nil, but there are to try and fill that vacuum, there are numerous hypotheses, all of them weak and all of them with very little in terms of evidence to support them. So if I get this right, then, so we have this document that's, according to some hypothesis, has been circulating amongst people for many, many years. And well, I wouldn't say circulating was the right word. It, it's been around in the sense that uh, I think, uh, it, it, and Graham, or it, it, now I, I wouldn't like to quote, uh, quote it incor incorrectly, but I think it was, it was left on a bookcase for a long time. So it was, it was, it was there in the pub, not in the public domain, but it was in their family's um, bookcase, in their family's treasure troves, if you like. 
Um, but it certainly what didn't go beyond the family, and even even within the family, within only within a couple of people, the, her father and grandfather. Um, and the first first people who get approached with it are a publisher. Correct. <laughs> there we go. So it's uh, it, it's fascinating, and and of course the other thing about uh, Maybrick is the supposed Maybrick watch as well. <laughs> it was found. Was this a year later? This was found, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> The, the, the watch suddenly appears uh, out out of the blue uh, when uh, a guy called Albert Johnson uh, contacts Robert Smith um, and he says he has Jack the Ripper's watch. Now it's it's uh, it's got it's got a few scratches on it. It's got I am Jack and it's got the initials of the five canonical victims scratched on it. Um, when Shirley Harrison, who wrote the book about the diary, first heard about it, she was appalled. She thought this was people just simply trying to jump on the bandwagon, you know, to say, "Oh, I've got, you know, I've got, I've got his watch," and you know, she half expected somebody else to come forward and say, "Well, I've got his knife and this," you know, trying to because they thought it was a bit of a, a cash cow. Um, in some ways, the watch is even more mysterious than the diary um, because the watch has been tested on a couple of occasions. And one of the reports um, by a, a Dr. Wilde of Bristol University said, now I think I've got here, somebody said, the engravings were at least several tens of years uh, of age. Now, those are the scratches. Now, how do we explain that? Well, once again, clever forgery. But one of the things that could have happened is, is that inside, when, when they extracted a little bit, that the, the instrument that they used to make the scratches could have been very old. So the watch itself, you know, they, they, just because there's the scratches on them doesn't mean the scratches themselves are very old, but the watch is old and the implement used to make the scratches were old. So as a result, you're going to get tiny little particles which are old. Um of course, all of that then, with, with both the diary and the watch, revolve around the notion that there were only five victims. And not everybody, of course, buys into that scenario either, do they? Well, of course, because we have the 11 Whitechapel murder victims. Uh, so it's uh, and playing into that canonical five issue that, uh, again, as you say, is, is very much disputed. Well, where, yeah. where is the watch now? Do we know where it is? Yeah, it, Albert Johnson and Michael Barrett are both dead. Um, the watch is, as far as I'm aware, is, is with Albert's um, god. Uh, sorry, Albert's granddaughter. Uh, she, she, they still live on the Wirral, uh, and she has the watch. It's still, it's still anyway within the Johnson family. No. And, first, and so, the big thing I have to ask then is. Uh, I think I know the answer to this because I think you made it quite clear. But do you think the, di the diary is genuine? Do I think the diary is genuine? No, 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 I don't at all. Uh, I, what I would like to say, though, because people think, oh, you know, I, I, I've sort of been very judgmental or I've just suddenly jumped on this. I've been looking at this for a long time, um, since 2007. And when I first looked at the issue, I was very open minded. I was prepared to, because I had a lot of knowledge about the Maybrick family, but I didn't have a lot of knowledge about the Ripper killings at that time. So I was prepared to be very open-minded. And, and when we set about doing this book, we looked at other, well, we looked at a variety of different hypotheses about, about the, the actual diary, whether it was a, an old diary, genuine, whether it was a modern forgery, but we also looked at whether it could have been constructed at a different time as well. So, for instance, um, whether it was produced an old diary, but not by Michael Barrett, but by people who may, who may have been contemporaneous with him, who lived after him. So, for instance, after the house is vacated, Battle Creek, where he lived, the next family to move in was the Fletcher Rogers family. Now, Fletcher Rogers had been the, the chairman at the inquest, at the inquest jury Um that he moves in, so there were, uh, and there was another family that related to the Hughes that came afterwards. So there were people who were very familiar with the Maybrick case, who were very familiar with James. Some of them didn't particularly like him. So we did look at the scenario that the diary could be an old fake, uh, not just a modern fake. Um, 
the only way we could we felt was the fair way to do it was, was to use t- a 10 point holistic test uh, and we decided that for the diary to be genuine it had to meet 10 criteria for instance the handwriting had to match the ink had to be genuine james had to match the the um, profile of a serial killer the author of the diary or journal would have to have an intimate knowledge of the Maybrick family. They would have to have a detailed knowledge of the Ripper killings. They would have to match the descriptions of, of the that we have of the eyewitnesses. Um, on all 10 of the criteria, it completely failed. So in our minds, there was we were drawn completely and utterly to the view it is undoubtedly 100% a forgery. So it, it, the, the handwriting didn't even match his? Oh, the handwriting doesn't match his in any way, shape or form. It's completely wrong. Um, now, when, when the diary first appeared in, in 1992, there was very little of James's handwriting that you could compare it with. There was a signature on his uh, wedding certificate and there was also uh, his will. Now, neither of those matched the handwriting of the diarist. So the people who thought the diary might be genuine then said, oh, well, hang on a minute, the will can't be right. Well, the will was right. It was accurate. It was genuine. But since then, anyway, we've we found a lot more of, of James's examples of James's handwriting. I, I've personally got a few um, in my own files examples of it. We found a whole stash of them in, in, in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, James got involved in a court case involving uh, land that was claimed by his wife and his wife's mother. Uh, So he sent a series of letters and telegrams. And from all of those, we can see clearly um, that it doesn't match the writing of the diarist. And you asked about scientific testing. Well, there's been quite a few handwriting experts pulled in over the years, some of them by the pro-diary camp, like Shirley Harrison, some of them by the skeptics. And every single one of them, every single one of them, without any exception, said the diarist handwriting does not match James's handwriting. They are different. To try and get around that point, a couple of different views have been put forward by the pro-diary camp. Number one, uh, as I said, was, was the will was wrong. Well, the will wasn't wrong, but we now have more evidence anyway. Um, number two, that... James, that, that, that anybody can disguise the handwriting. And there have been examples of some, even some serial killers who've done that. But within the diary or within the writing, within the narrative of the journal, James makes ple- provides plenty of clues to who he is. It says the name of his wife, or the, the, the nickname of his wife that he gave her. It mentions the names of his children. It mentions the name of his house. So he's making no effort to disguise his pers- who he is. So why would he disguise his handwriting? So having fallen on that hurdle, they come another hurdle. So well, how, well, maybe because he was under the influence of drugs, um, because and he did take heroin and strychnine. That would have distorted his handwriting. Well, once again, handwriting experts have looked at that possibility, and every single one of them, without any exception, say when they look at the handwriting, they say, no, that handwriting does not match James's handwriting. He didn't try to disguise it. And he wasn't under the influence of drugs. And even if he was, you could still identify some clear patterns so that you could make a link. Mm-hmm. The handwriting is, is a major stumbling block for the pro diary uh, or the people who believe the diary is authentic. In fact, I would say it's an insurmountable stumbling block. And, and you mentioned children. Uh, are there any direct descendants still around? Or? No, there's, there's not. Uh, James and Florence had two children. Uh, and at the time of the murder, uh, the, the the boy was seven and the young girl, Gladys, was three. Um, they both grew up into adulthood. Um, the boy became a, a mining engineer and he went to work in Canada. And when he was in Canada, he was involved in a very tragic accident in which he swallowed cyanide and accidentally died. Now, that's an interesting case because the people who believe in the diary have suggested that, he could, you know, he may have found out his dad was Jack the Ripper and he had to kill himself. Um, now, we spent a lot of time looking at 
what happened to him and his death. And we've got, we've got his, the, 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 it was this inquest, as you can imagine, into his death. And it's absolutely clear it was just a tragic accident. He, he, he had two beakers on his desk. But they weren't, they were, they were, they were what you would normally have your cyanide in. It wasn't a normal glass. In one of them he had cyanide, and one of them he had water. Um it, 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 it's 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 hundred percent clear that he killed himself. He was he was a very happy guy. He was engaged to be married. He didn't commit suicide. Um the girl Gladys, she she grew up into adulthood and married, but she never had any children. So the lad, uh, James, James Ch Chandler, as his name was, he never had any children because he died, as I say, when he was a mining engineer. Uh, and the daughter, Gladys, did marry, but never had children. Supposedly, she said, she, she didn't want to have any children, because not because of anything to do with her father being Jack the Ripper, or supposedly Jack the Ripper, but because of the link to her mother. It, it's pretty clear that both children believed that the mother killed the father. Uh, it's likely that happened because after James died and Florence was in prison, they spent some time with Dr. Fuller, who was Michael Maybrick's, James's brother's doctor. Uh, but then they grew up with Michael Maybrick. And there's no doubt about it, the Maybrick brothers uh, coloured the way that the children were thinking. And they came to believe um, that the mother was guilty of the crime of murder. So... Their distaste was nothing to do with the father. It was to do with the mother. And in fact, Gladys kept on a, a, a loving treasure that she had was a picture of her father as a young man. So they both deeply mourned the father, but not the mother. There's a slight irony there, isn't there? If there this is. guy supposedly Jack the Ripper. And of course, Michael has also turned up on the endless list of suspects <laughs> as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, as you know, Michael Michael Maybrick is, is, was proposed as a, as a suspect by um, Bruce Robinson. Um, in the in the book that we've written, we do devote uh, a section onto that um, because we believe his account of of the Maybrick household and the, and the trial of Florence is full of inaccuracies and mistakes. Um, so we we don't uh, believe. In his views at all, uh, one of the things he does suggest is that that he wrote the diary, or Michael Maybrick, he forged the diary, pretending to be James, to frame James to be Jack the Ripper, so that after James Maybrick died, the authorities were no longer looking for Jack the Ripper because they believed he was dead. Well, why would James finger his own brother, who he deeply loved, you know, as a suspect? You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, and if he was going to use the diary as, as, a, as, as a weapon to criminalise his brother, why didn't it appear for a, uh, another 100 years? And also, if, it, if the handwriting doesn't match James's handwriting, it doesn't match it, Michael's handwriting either. Um, it's, it, I, I, I do enjoy Bruce's book, but there's so much in there I fundamentally disagree with. <laughs> and uh, so bringing me back to the, to James... What was he like as a person? Would you describe him as a likable person? Somebody, somebody you'd go down the pub with and have a good chat with. Was it? Was it? Was, it, was he a pleasant chap? Okay. It, 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 the, the funny thing about James and Florence is that they both had contradictory traits. And one of the problems we have today is that we see James through the prism of the diary. So we we see him as a as an unpleasant sort of guy, and there's no doubt about it. He was a flawed character. And we do know, for instance, um, that at least on one occasion, he did give his wife, you know, a, a beating. She had a black eye um, in March 1889 after a big row they had at the Grand National. Um, other people talked about him having like flashes of, of, of aggression. Um, but on the other hand, he was a very kind man. He was a very generous man. Um, he was a man who had a huge number of friends, both male and female. Um, he was also a man who was empathetic. Now, psychopathic serial killers tend not to fall into that particular character, but he was a man who, who called his wife Bunny, who when he went to the office would give her a kiss. And after this terrible row that they had, I mentioned before, when he gave his wife a black eye, he, he spent the night downstairs and he was seen crying by... Uh, 
one of the, one of the servants in the house. He was walking up and down, deep, deeply upset, crying. He got up early in the morning and made a, f- a fire for his wife as a sort of small little effort, you know, uh, to try and build a bridge again. Um, even when he knew or certainly suspected his wife had an affair, um, he he went down to London to pay her her. her um, debts that she'd accrued and various things. So he wasn't all bad. He certainly wasn't all good and he was certainly flawed. But would you like to have a pint with him? I think you would. He was a man who was a member of, of several clubs, um, both in Liverpool and America. And everybody who speaks of him speaks of him in those circles in glowing terms. And he was a man, by the way, who liked to drink and to smoke like to play cards and he liked horse, uh, betting on horse and he liked horse riding. So, you know, he, he, you would like to have a pint with him, yes. And Florence, what was she, was she, because obviously we just know through what we have, the trial, what, was she a, a nice, a, she, she was from a wealthy background, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Florence was, a, 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 Florence as well as James, both had contradictory traits. And a, as a result of that, it's sometimes hard to disentangle the full truth. But on the other hand, we, we're, we're all a bit like that. Aren't we? Anyway, we all have our good days and our bad days and good moments and bad moments. And that was Florence. Uh, Florence's family on paper were very wealthy, yes. Um, but she, she led quite a turbulent childhood because uh, her actual father was a banker in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, and he died in 1863. And he died in 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 the in the uh, the American War of Civil War, so um, some people think he died um, before Florence was born. We found evidence that suggests that Florence was a couple of months old when he died. Um, Florence, his mother, then got married on another three occasions. On the last occasion, she married a Prussian officer, so she became a baroness. But he didn't have much money, despite his title. The money that Florence's family had came from Florence's mother's father, um, who was a a businessman and a speculator who owned quite a large amount of land in America. Um, The problem that that they always had was that they hadn't done very much with the land. Uh, Other people had occupied it, so they got involved in long-running legal disputes over the land. Um, So on paper, she was very wealthy. But in practice, they were always struggling uh, for money. Um, Florence, as I say, was as a as a young person, seems to have been not in the best of health. She had a brother who died of consumption or tuberculosis, as we call it today. Uh, and Florence seems to be a person who who, who may have also uh, been susceptible to that particular illness. Um, she seemed to have been very quiet. Uh, and she also seems to have liked very few things. She certainly liked horses, horse riding, and she liked painting. Now, in Victorian society, many women were very career-minded and, and very frustrated by the, the norms and mores of Victorian society that said that women should stay at home. Florence was quite amenable to that idea. She liked to be pampered. She liked to stay at home. Um, she, some people said that she wasn't very clever. But, uh, including her own mother, by the way, but on the other hand, in later life, she wrote a book and she went on a nationwide tour of America, giving two hour talks. So what I think that shows is that, that, that Florence was a person of resolve and although on the one hand, she does appear quite sort of light and flippant, uh, not a very strong character, a key moment in her life she proved herself to be much stronger. Um, she spent 15 years in prison and survived. Um, she went back to America, toured America, something of a celebrity. She spent the last 20 years of her life in, in relative poverty, but she survived it all. She outlived James by for 50 years. So underneath the sort of the light, frothy side that sometimes portrayed of her, there was a woman who had a steely edge. And there was quite there was an age difference, wasn't there? She she was in her twenties; he was in his fifties. Yeah, yeah, you're quite right. Yeah, when they first met, when they got married, James was was roughly forty three, and she would have been about nineteen. 
Um, so you're quite right. There was a huge age difference. Um, in Victorian society, that wouldn't have seen as quite as bad as, well, not bad's the wrong word, but, you know, it wouldn't have been as, quite as noticeable, should we say, as, it, as we would say today. Um, James had been on the lookout for a, a wealthy American heiress for quite a while. He nearly married another, we found that we nearly, he got engaged to another woman who looked a similar age to Florence, uh, looked actually very similar physically as well, and came from a very wealthy background. For some reason, that particular uh, engagement never came to anything. But James was on a lookout for a young, attractive, rich American woman. And he, I think he thought he hit the jackpot when he found Florence. The Florence Maybrick case prior to 1992. Was that really well known in the 50s and the 60s? Or was it the diary that brought it back into prominence? Okay, now that's a very interesting point you make there. Uh, the answer to the question is, is it would have been known, yes. It would have been known primarily because of the, of the trial. Um, what makes the trial so important is, is that most people believed that it was a miscarriage of justice. But in those days, there was no court of appeal. So um, it was one of the cases that was used by those, uh, those advocates who wanted to establish the court of appeal in this country. Um, so in that, in that sense, it's a landmark case, and it became very well remembered. The fact that she was an American and he was British um, also added to the drama. You know, three American presidents campaigned or wrote letters of support for Florence. Queen Victoria was adamant that she shouldn't be released because she saw her as a fallen woman and therefore could be criminally uh, a, a criminal woman as well. Um, so there was a lot of drama about it, and there'd been several books written about it, um, going all the way back to, to the 50s and the 60s. And not only that, it, was, it, it, it regularly appears on um, newspaper articles, and, um, and round about just before the diary did surface, there was a, a reenactment of the trial that took place in St. George's Hall, Liverpool. Um, that could have acted as a trigger for somebody who, who was looking at the case. There, there were quite a few um, other books that came out round about that time. And there was, there was also um, a picture that was put in the Liverpool Echo of the offices uh, where James Maybrick worked. Now, that was in the, in the Liverpool Echo in 1989. Um, a, a, a photographer, uh, Arthur, uh, Arthur Lewis, Jeff Lewis, Jeff Lewis had, had taken some pictures of Liverpool just to, as, as people were knocking buildings down. He wanted to preserve what the old buildings look like. And one of them was the Knowsley building on Tyburn Street um, where James had worked. He, that picture featured in, in, in the Liverpool Echo. After the building was knocked down and offices were built there called Silk House Court, Anne Graham, the wife of Mike Barrett, worked in Silk House Court. Now, I'm not saying for one second that Anne Graham was responsible for the diary, but what I am saying, around in the, in the, in the years preceding the sudden appearance of the diary, there were quite a lot of stories, programmes on TV, articles in the newspaper, all about the Maybrick case. It would have, could have acted as a real catalyst for somebody with a, uh, the mind so to do to, to construct a forgery. And of course... What the books provide as well is an awful lot of material for a potential forger. You know, the, the books tell you that James went down to London. The books tell you a little bit about his character. The books provide some dates. The books provide some nicknames. Um, so uh, it, 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 there's a lot of uh, material that a potential forger could use. And a lot of that came into the public domain in the years preceding the sudden emergence of the diary. It is such a fantastic story. It really is. Where can, where can viewers get your book from? Uh, what, okay. What's the book called to begin with? Okay. The, the book deals with the two elements of, of the story that we've been talking about th this morning is, is that there are some wonderful books on the Maybrick case, and there are some pretty excellent books on the Ripper diary, but what, but they tend to be two separate entities. And that most of those books never really come, especially on the, on the Florence case, come up with definitive answers. 
So what we tried to do is to put both elements or both stories in the one book. Hence the, 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 the title of the book is The Maybrick Murder and The Diary of Jack the Ripper, The End Game. The End Game because we do give two clear conclusions. So the constructions of most chapters, not all the chapters, come in two parts, not two equal parts. The first part deals with the Florence Maybrick story, and then we have a bit that calls we call the Ripper Link, and it deals with an aspect of the diary story. And sometimes there's a clear overlap. So, for instance, let me give you an example. In, in March 1889, the Maybricks attend the Grand National in Liverpool. Uh, it's quite a pivotal event because they have this very public row uh, and James hits Florence. We deal with that in the first bit of the chapter. In the second bit of the chapter, we deal with the diary link because the diarist writes about the race. It was one of the fastest races I'd ever attended. So you can see how the two sort of dovetail, in, dovetail into one another. And some people like Paul Fellman and Robert Smith make a lot of that because they say, how, how did the diarist, the only way the diarist could have known that is if he was at the event. Um, Paul Feldman says he asked one of his assistants to track down the information and she took a few days and couldn't find anything about it. Well, I went to the Liverpool Public Records and in the library there, I found it in two minutes. There's a book there that was there in, in 1989, which gives the times of all the races all you've got to do is open the one book and on one page, there's the times for all the races. Very easy to find out. And by the way, it wasn't the fastest race. Um, so, but you can see the way the, 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 the book is constructed. We try to link in with the two. In both cases, we try to, well, certainly in, in, in the Florence story, we bring in a whole lot of new evidence. Um, we've gone into places where people have never been before. We found a lot of new material on James and Florence. For example, Florence's mother's second husband, uh, Captain Dubarry, served in the American Civil War on, on the Confederate side, even though he was from the North. We've got his entire military records from the war, uh, a lot of new material in there. And that's just one example. In the case of, of the, the, the diary, um, I've, I've been fortunate to speak to all the key players. I, I, spent, uh, I spoke to uh, Mike Barrett, at great length in his house, and he, as I say, rang me. Uh, I, I spoke to Albert Johnson on quite a few occasions. I even went to his funeral. Um, I only met Anne Graham once uh, very recently, and she was very kind enough to spend uh, an afternoon with me. Uh, although, in the main, we only talked about, well, we mainly talked about the Florence case as opposed to the diary. Um, so, We've got new material in there. We've got new detailed information about the floorboards and the, and, the, and, the, and the electrician's hypothesis. We've got a whole load of new pictures. So we like to think um, that although it's a book in which many other books have been written, this book really provides a comprehensive view of both stories and a definitive answer to both of them as well. But uh, I've read through it and it is a fantastic book and it really does open your eyes to, uh, well, two fascinating cases, actually, in Jack the Ripper and the, the Maybrick trial, uh, Florence Maybrick. So, Chris, it's been wonderful speaking to you. And, my, uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, very nice. Very nice to meet you. So thank you very much.